I'm super excited to introduce uh, for uh, introduce our next talk, State of the Shell. Hello. Whoa. Hello, Gladek. How are you doing? Hope you're doing all right. Um, welcome to the nth edition of State of the Shell. As Jonathan once said, um, this is an acquired taste, and I hope you have a delightful meal of information today. <laughs> um, hope you're all ready. Um, this is me and Florian here. Uh, we have some folks in the Berlin side of Guadalajara too. Um, in the Berlin side, we have Carlos Garnacho and Robert Mader. So, um, a honorable mention that is not here, unfortunately, but helped us a lot through making this presentation is Jonas Adl. Um, yeah, Jonas is not here, but spiritually, he's everywhere here, <laughs> permeating this presentation all around. Um, welcome. Let's begin, as always, with mutter stuff. Um, this is a highly technical presentation, so I apologize for like just jumping straight into the hardcore coding stuff, but let's, let's try and do it. Um, Mutter has a website. Jakob has been doing fancy little websites for all GNOME projects, and we were the latest victims of the websitization. We have a nice pixel art. There is supposed to be a cat there, but I don't think you can see in the, <laughs> in the projector. <laughs> but yeah, mutter.gnome.org, you can go check it out. And we have documentation pages for um, the APIs that Mutter exposes. Usually that's useful for shell extension developers. Um, Splutter, Mutter, Coggle, and everything in between. Um, so yeah, go check it out, mutter.gnome.org. That's mutter.gnome.org. Um, yeah, one particular feature that it's going to be nice to mention here, it was thanks to our great friend Bilal, we, have, we are able to make pure Wayland builds now. You can build GNOME shell and Mutter, in this case we're talking about Mutter, but you can build Mutter without linking to X11. Um, I think directly and indirectly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it doesn't pull in any X11 dependency anymore these days. Um, the goal here is to be able to produce legacy free builds, as uh, Bilal put it. Um, yeah, it required lots of refactorings. It required untangling a lot of old craft. Mutter was born um, out of Metacity, which is an X11 window manager and a compositor. Um, so X11 is ever present in this code base, and we are slowly ripping it apart. And, um, well, Bilal has been mostly like ripping it apart and getting rid of uh, the dependencies in there. So now we, we reach the point where we can build without it. It is um, opt out at this point, I think. Um, the next cool thing um, that I want to mention is explicit sync, which is something that people have been talking about for a long while. Um, this particular feature um, is heavily associated with NVIDIA. Um, although it is like, it has its own merits outside of just making NVIDIA work. Um, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting way to make composition and, and sharing uh, GPU load between processes. So essentially, you have instead of like creating a frame and sending it, you add like little timeline points and you send these timeline points to other processes. Like in this case, usually it's the compositor. So um, the protocol name is, I think it's sync timeline, sync timeline object, sync object timeline, or something like that. Um, so again, even though it is heavily associated with NVIDIA because this is required to make um, GNOME shell and the compositor and everything work Flickr free on NVIDIA, it is going to benefit um, other parts of the stack. It is pretty interesting on its own uh, merits. And to me personally, I think, what makes it super exciting is that it's going to help with a Vulkan transition, which is not something that we have on the table, but um, Vulkan, the API, exposes this in way, one way or another. So 
um, it is good for the compositor to have support for that so that we can um, support Vulkan on the app side and then maybe we can think, start thinking about supporting Vulkan on uh, GNOME side. But to be clear, there's currently no realistic plans to make that happen right now. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, this code was, I think it was mostly written by um, somebody from NVIDIA, actually. Um, uh, Ashton, I think, maybe. I'm sorry, I, I should have remembered that, but I don't. Um, but thanks to the person who wrote this. Um, the patches were accepted and they are gonna be ready for uh, GNOME 46. They are ready for GNOME 46, so they are now ready on a release. What people have been working on right now is to make screencasting use explicit sync. So just like applications send a, a sync timeline point for the compositor, the compositor can send a sync line, timeline point for applications when it shares a screencasting buffer with applications. And that way you have both applications giving buffers to the compositor and compositor giving buffers to application flicker free on NVIDIA and fancy on every other um, driver. So yeah, we have that um, for the next one. We have DR Emily's. This has been long in the making. There have been talks about some sort of service for the session to handle these um, devices. But in the end, we had a Wayland protocol available and um, we just landed. I think most of the work, originally the work was implemented by Jonas Adel and then it was picked up by four or five different people over, over the years. <laughs> but eventually the final iteration was merged from um, Jose Esposito, I think. So yeah, thanks for pushing that to the finish line, Jose. Um, yeah, we have that. So that means one particular part of the VR story is complete now. I don't think, I, as far as I understand it, it is not completely complete. So this is the, the compositor side of the story. It is working, but we don't have a, a full story, a full picture for, for example, sandboxed uh, VR SDKs, for example. Um, so that's still pending. Nothing to do with mother, of course. The mother side is figured it out, uh, figured out at this point. Yeah, so we have that. Um, for the next one is something that I've been particularly working over the past four years and <laughs> without much success until last month. <laughs> um, snapshotting. Um, so this is something that when Clutter was originally merged into the Mutter code base, um, if you don't know, we have Clutter and Coggle inside Mutter. They are forks of the original projects. The original projects are archived and our fork still lives on inside Mutter. Um, and we, when it was brought into the code base, it already had some initial work from Emanuele Bassi on paint nodes and deferred rendering, but it was super far-fetched, like it required still a lot of work to, to complete the story. Um, and over the years, there, ha there have been like flickery progress on this on and off. Um, but finally, like after GTK folks presented us with a fantastic API for snapshotting, um, I think it was pretty clear that we should definitely be heavily inspired in that. And I'm saying this, just not say that we just copied that and <laughs> changed the function names. Um, but it was pretty good, and now we're adding something spiritually similar to Mutter. Um, what is the third rendering, you may ask? And I had to look it up. It was exactly four years ago that I wrote this slide. Um, this is a paint node tree. This is just an example, tiny little example. So essentially you have rendering operations like paint a color at a particular rectangle or change the transform matrix to something else or maybe um, clip the contents to, to this particular rectangle or this particular box or paint this particular image in this particular rectangle. All those things are paint operations and in Clutter they're modeled as a tree of operations. So that for example, um, here we have a clip tree um, this one over here, um, 
Everything that happens inside the clip, uh, every child of the clip node is going to operate under that particular clip, so they are not going to draw outside of that particular area that is being clipped to. Um, this is, I think, slightly different from the GTK approach, which is just a list of operations with um, a linear list of things. We have a tree of things. Um, but yeah, essentially, snapshotting is an object that allows us to build this tree without having to create each node individually and think about them individually. Um, and as of three weeks ago, I think, I managed to get the first build of GNOME shell that was able to output a complete paint node tree from everything, drawing the wallpapers, the top bar, the windows, the uh, textures of the windows, subsurfaces, and everything, effects, all that you can think of, all in a massive tree of paint operations. It was super slow, it's terrible. I don't think anybody should use this at this point, but <laughs> it works. Um, yeah, that's something I've been working on. Um, and it's still an experiment. I don't have a timeline for when this is going to happen. But it's, to me, it's super exciting because this is going to make um, a little bit easier to implement things like um, plane offloading. So you can take like a window and put it in an overlay plane. And that usually helps with um, low power devices. You save some energy if you don't have to composite the full window, the full screen over and over. You just take a window and put it on a plane. Take a window, put it on a plane, every frame. It's just so much easier to skip the whole thing. Um, it also allows some post-processing post of the node tree, so you can have some slightly optimizations, reduce overdrawing, and all this fancy you know, graphics stuff that are hard to get through. Um, and I think that's going to be it for me, because the next topic is on Robert about HDR. <clears throat> yeah, do you hear me? Does that somewhat sound good on, on your side? Can I have a quick egg that you can hear me, Claudius? Hello, hello? We can hear you. We can hear you. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear can you. I? Okay, cool. Uh, so the HDR stuff part is uh, something mostly Sebastian Wick and Jonas Adler have been working on. Um, I'll try to represent that in their set as good as I can. Uh, I'll, I won't go into detail what HDR is. I hope. Um, to have some idea, but maybe the one quick note, what's important here is um, HDR is more than just more colors, but especially means something like um, you have white that is whiter than what your normal white is. Um, this will be yeah, important. Um, overall, the reason why all this work in HDR takes so long um, is that in a general desktop environment, things are way more complex than in an embedded space where you might have just one full screen game, one full screen video. Um, we have, like, generally, we, uh, we have to mix HDR content with um, SDR, like legacy classical content, in a seamless manner. Um, and as you know, uh, as I just said, like you might have an HDR video where have, you have super bright light, uh, or, uh, yeah, super bright white, which um, is so white that you, if you would make your whole screen that way, you could, would get um, totally, your eyes would hurt. And next to it, you have an HDR client, which is also white, but this white is, of course, much less white. And this is all something that the compositor has to get right. Mm. Um, and yeah, now with the upcoming release in 47, we um, have that kind of running. We can now mix HDR and SDR content um, in our experimental mode. And um, the Wayland protocols are getting closer to get merged, and um, there was also a recent Hackfest um, where we got things closer, and hopefully all of this will drop soon. Um, more likely 48 than 47. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, a note here is that on a lot of hardware, enabling the HDR mode can cause increased um, yeah, power usage. That is because, because you want to have the super wide white, um, you need a lot of backlight power if you use a technology which is, for example, not OLED. And so this is heavily hardware dependent, but in generally, in general, um, at least in the beginning, uh, we will have to make it an optional thing. And um, for now, this is kind of hidden in looking glass or debug tool. And uh, soon we'll probably have like options for that, even us in GNOME. <laughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> nice. <laughs> and uh, this is a um, not really HDR related thing, but it's kind of preparation for that. Um, what happened in the last uh, during the last year is that we finally moved from. 8-bit um, components to 10-bit components for the default like um, back buffer uh, that we draw in Mada, which means uh, like you will have less, or you might have noticed that you have less banding um, artifacts in some situations, which is nice, and we need it anyway for HDR. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we got a lot of awesome work on variable refresh rates. Um, shortly here again, like for many actions like scrolling and so on, you of course want the highest refresh rate your monitor supports. In other situation, especially for videos, for example here, you watch a video with 60 FPS on a monitor with 144 Hertz. This doesn't quite match. It's not a multiple of each other. And therefore, you get not optimal results. So in short, um, for video, it's often nice to, to reduce the refresh rate. For games, it's a total, uh, it's even a more complex um, topic as far as I know. Won't get into that. Um, the decision when exactly to enable that, that is again a bit hard and we haven't that fully figured out. So this is still considered an experimental feature because we would like to not have an option, which is our big goal, of course, always. Um, and the, yeah, the kernel IPS are also not quite where we, we would like them to be. Um, expect further development. <laughs> Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Video of loading. This is now a topic that I, I actually worked on and can say something about. Um, <laughs> why we or YCRCB support, um, this is about um, a pixel format. In short, it's often better to use one of these formats instead of RGB uh, because for the content in, um, it's often allows us to use less space. Um, this is called subsampling. And um, normally hardware decoders, for example, or also software decoders produce these pixel formats. But to when we put the content on the screen eventually, at some point we have to convert from YV to RGB. And um, classically, normally, uh, until very, very recently, most of your apps did that like themselves and then send, send the RGB format to a compositor, which then put it on screen. Now you can actually pass on YV buffers directly to the Wayland compositor, which again, might, in some cases, if the stars align, as Matthias Klaassen said yesterday, uh, I think, um, can then again be passed on to display hardware. And this allows us to, yeah, to do, uh, allows GTK4 video players, for example, or also in hopefully soon browsers, etc., to play video much more efficiently. So you get maybe, in some cases, several hours more battery life. Uh, it's also 
a bit related to the HDR part before, because um, depending, like if you have an HDR video, you need all the information passed to the compositor to do this conversion properly. Um, so this kind of get, goes hand in hand and allows us to yeah, become a quite good video platform increasingly. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, oh, yeah. I didn't say that this YUV support landed in 45. And in 46, we built up, uh, we um, yeah, had a few, a few improvements on that side, um, especially that we finally started to use a dedicated um, display hardware to do scaling and cropping options, or just to support that. And that means that uh, a client can send us content, and even if it doesn't match the screen exactly, for example, if we a video again in full screen mode, um, even if that video doesn't has the exact same uh, the exact resolution we need for the screen, we can now just scale it and very efficient or use very efficient hardware to do that. Um, also cropping and. One optimization which I'm very happy about is that we also allow direct scan out, which is like sending the content directly to the display hardware, even if it um, needs black bars on the side. And um, for that, in some cases, we need the information from, uh, from the client that this is a black area and there's a dedicated um, protocol Wayland, which it also has other usages, but especially for that, it's very useful to say, hey, uh, I want to create a black area. And if a client does that, like creates a black area, and on top of that, there is content like either video or a game or something, uh, which is smaller, uh, we detect that and can use the display hardware again to show the content on a single hardware plane. Uh, because in Mada, so far, we only support a single hardware plane apart from the cursor plane. Uh, if you don't know the word, doesn't matter. Um, we plan to improve on that even more uh, and in the future also support so-called overlay and underlay planes. Uh, this is technic yeah, technical details, but in a short, in short, with Wayland, we can use display hardware the way it's like, we can use features of display hardware to make things way more um, yeah, efficient. Okay, next slide. Uh, screencasting, very shortly, uh, we had a few performance improvements. We have explicit modifier support now, which is great for several things and explicit sync, as we said before. It's now supported. Next slide. Mm. Yeah, so these are my bits. Uh, so uh, during the last year, uh, we managed to get the last pieces of the graph work. Uh, this is something that has been happening during the last uh, three years or four. Uh, it was a reunification of the mechanisms that allow to redirect input uh, within the shell. And it used to be quite a disaster, like the five or six different pieces of grabbing mechanisms, the different ways to redirect events somewhere else. And now everything is going through a single mechanism uh, in the shell and towards Wayland clients and everything, and everything integrates properly in the shell. So yeah, it, it allows us to, to deal with input in a quite more consistent way than that we could not afford to do before, so that's nice. In 46, we also got merged the gesture framework from Jonas. And yeah, <laughs> and hopefully we would like to build on top of that uh, for 47 and to actually include the, uh, some gestures that use this framework and uh, integrate them in the shell. and. It's still under review, but optimistically it should happen. 
And then there's also some work from uh, coming from STF, uh, from Dorota and uh, uh, and Matt uh, about working on global shortcuts, uh, both for applications, both phase two applications and phase two accessibility, which is something that uh, was kind of lacking. But uh, well, we we now have two two implementations even. So uh, it will be sorted out and it ho will hopefully land for 47. Um, next slide, please. So we also got earned uh, quite some configuration uh, for input devices. Uh, for tablets, the, there is a, an improved uh, pressure curve calculation uh, where, well, we used to have very uh, in, in settings, you could get to choose uh, how much pressure should the Astilus handle. And it did have a, a too few options. So we've increased that. So it's basically a, a now a, a continuous slider. So you can get to the size a, a suitable curve between hundreds instead of seven. Uh, there's also a pressure range support where uh, besides the pressure curve uh, that there is in some devices the uh, the topmost pressure that you can apply it could actually physically break the device so the users would like to narrow that so uh, or, or or even on the other side uh, a too soft uh, touch uh, would already produce input when even when in student. Uh, so the user can now narrow the, the, the edges of this pressure curve. So uh, yeah, the, they don't have to stuff the tablet to, to get maximum pressure or, or, or the minimum pressure works uh, as expected. There is also stylus actions. Uh, so you can apply uh, key bindings or switching to another display through the stylus buttons. Uh, this was previously available for uh, pads, which are the collection of buttons on the side of the tablet, but now you can also do it from the stylus. There is also tablet disambiguation, which is most relevant for uh, professional artist setups. Like uh, imagine you have, uh, there are tablets which are attached to a display and people even have two of them, which are the same identical brand and model. So we can now disambiguate which one is left and which one is right. So we always configure the left one as the left one and the right one as the right one. It's a convenience for, for really advanced setups. And we also got uh, trackball independent settings, uh, which, which are separated from mouse settings. Uh, so well, people using trackballs uh, and, and track points, uh, they also get some some more granularity. And we also got uh, the ability to set, to provide the XKB model, which might, for people who have keyboards that not have more keys than the PC 105 uh, kind of default. So, so yeah, next slide, please. And we also got uh, a few Wayland protocol implementations, some on the way, some, some already landed. Uh, we got DRM list, uh, which was already covered. We got a Linux DRM sync object, which is about uh, synchronization, which was also covered before. We got XDG dialog, which is uh, an extension of the private GTK protocol uh, and made actually proper upstream and uh, we now use that to, to declare relations between windows. We got a stable tablet protocol, uh, which uh, was about time since, uh, well, it, it was done like years ago and it hasn't changed too substantially, so it made sense to be stable. And we also got uh, a session management implementation, which hopefully will land for 47 uh, and, well, uh, be a, allow uh, applications to store the their state uh, in the compositor, like the window positions and workspaces and sizes and and everything. Next slide. Uh, yeah, 
well, uh, special mention. Next. <laughs> I can take it over. Um, um, yeah, so basically, very briefly, special mentions, honorable mentions, they couldn't fit in a, they didn't deserve, quote unquote, a slide of their own, but um, basically this is the Bilal's work um, <laughs> uh, mention. Lots of Kaggle cleanups. We removed more than 7,000 lines of code from Kaggle in the last cycle. Um, we don't depend on JSON glib anymore. Um, um, and I think the biggest subject, um, the biggest topic um, on a few pull requests was, was also removing Cairo from the dependencies, the external and internal dependencies of Mutter, um, which is um, also pretty difficult, uh, but it's happening. This is uh, all, I think all of these points are, have been done by Bilal, so huge thanks for, to Bilal. And now we're gonna quickly move to, oops. Does it make sense? You know, Michelle? We have five minutes to rush through everything plus questions. It's pictures. <laughs> okay, I try to rush through the remaining slides like the Gnome Shell side. So starting with notifications, um, that's just an like, ongoing process. Uh, it was on the design team's wish list for like, a long time. And it's finally happening thanks to uh, sovereign tech fund funding. Um, part of it is already in 46. What is mentioned here are like, the user visible changes. There was also like a lot of uh, refactoring and API changes uh, involved. But what we got was headers uh, on top of every notifications, uh, the ability to expand notifications in the, in the calendar list to get access to, to actions uh, and the, the full text. This is also now um, available in the, the banners inside the session so that you can actually expand notifications on touch. We hope to uh, implement uh, grouping by app uh, this cycle, but it's still like with a question mark because like um, the merge request is still in draft status, and I've, even if it gets like submitted for review like today, um, UI freeze is creeping up on us. So we will probably honor the good old tradition of asking for a freeze request. Um, some of the work involves protocol changes, like um, additions to the, the notifications portal. Um, this is still under discussion, so it won't make it to 47, but hopefully in 48, applications can make use of those new APIs. This is how uh, like a group notification would look when it is expanded. Then, uh, I think this is also part of STF. I'm not sure. Um, so this is part of like digital well-being um, to configure like uh, forced breaks um, that you have to take to like not strain your eyes too much, uh, get enough movement, not sit around for uh, for hours. Uh, you can configure it to like send like a gentle notification. You can also um, configure it to just lock the screen to force a break. Accent colors is something that Alice worked on. Most of the work uh, involved was in libadvator, but uh, we also support it in the shell now. Um, it is like a controlled way of allowing customizations without like a full theme that can like significantly break apps. So it should be like a lot safer, but still like be allow users to like do some fun customizations. It has been standardized as part of the XDG settings portal. So it should be, like it's, at least it is possible for like other platforms to support it. Uh, there's interest to implement it, like support it uh, in, in elementary and in KDE. Hopefully like third party apps will also like support it. There have been like a couple of uh, accessibility improvements, nothing major and probably should skip over those. Uh, some of the, the screen crossing improvement have been on the, on the shell side as well. There's like a built-in screen recorder and uh, it's now possible to like use DMA buff uh, if possible, which allows the comp like to pass uh, 
around buffers between the composite and the recording process without doing unnecessary copies, so it's more efficient. And uh, in the next, in the upcoming versions, if available, it's also possible to use like uh, hardware encoding if supported by, like if the, the drivers are uh, installed and supported. Some special mentions here as well. The on-screen keyboard was improved. That is already in 46. I quickly just quickly mention it. Um, the extension state has been improved. Not sure I should explain that. This, there was also like a kind of there was also like a slight ambiguous uh, ambiguity between. Uh, a user requesting an, an, an extension to be enabled and an extension actually being enabled. We now have like two separate states for this to make the distinction where it makes sense. For instance, if the user wants an extension to enable, to, uh, to enable an extension, but uh, it fails and is an error state and not enabled, but still uh, the user would like it. And there we are with questions and one minute left. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> On the final Hello. slide, it said captive Does portal. Okay. Um, I have one question. And it's um, about the, uh, the the compositor passing through like uh, videos and stuff. Um, can is there also maybe in the future more stuff possible like rounded corners or other cool things and not just like maybe black bars at the sides? Um, I, I think I'll take that. Um, so. <laughs> Who's talking? Okay. Um, so we talked about that at the recent API Hackfest in Spain. And there are good arguments for thinking about some well and protocol extension, which would then maybe allow that. So we can have something like a PIP window with a video which is still hardware offloaded and super efficient. Uh, no concrete plans yet. Yeah. Mm. But we would like to see it at some point. We have a question here in, in Denver. Can you? Okay. Hi. Um, on the final slide, um, it mentioned uh, improvements to captive portal handling. Could you just give a few more words about what that means? Uh, the captive portal? You want to talk about it? Oh, um, like captive portals are what you have, for instance, on free Wi-Fi's on on, uh, on airports or like at venues like here. That uh, right now we detect like uh, like limited network access, and we just pop up the the portal login. Uh, the changes are that instead we do something similar to, to Android, we pop up a notification that, oh, oh want, do you want to sign into this network? You click the notification and only then you, we pop up the, the login portal. It's not like a huge change, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning. It does have a CVE for some reason, so. We, I think we had one more question. We'll take that one and then we can finish. We have a question here in Denver. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned Wayland only builds. Uh, does that mean no X Wayland, or does that still work? Um, it can mean both. Like, uh, it's possible to disable support for X11, like running on top of an X11, like an X, uh, X server. Uh, it's also possible to disable like even uh, support for X11 apl applications. We don't expect that to be like the default anywhere, anywhere, anytime soon. But it's like like it's those are two different things, and uh, both are supported by build options. Okay, thank you. Not not in random. Uh, well, can you shortly repeat the question? 
Um, you asked for to repeat the question. Is that it? Oh, uh, Florian, can, can you repeat, surely repeat the question? It unfortunately didn't arrive here from the screen uh, as okay. dream. Oh, whether like uh, this like um, valent only builds was about disabling uh, XORG support or also disabling support for XValent. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we're wrapping up then. Yeah. Thank you. We have one more. Thank you.